welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. Today, I'm kind of uh, just going solo here, and we're going to cover some Bible teaching that many people may not be aware of. In fact, I've decided to entitle this particular show, Unpopular Bible Doctrines. So, what I'm going to try to do here today is just show you Bible teachings that are unpopular, that people don't like, or they don't know about. Uh, but I guess the main thing is they're unpopular in the sense that they don't mesh in with our modern politically correct culture and its idea of the way things should be. Uh, it would never fit in with some of these uh, TV shows that might be out there that, you know, uh, I don't really know what they call them now, but shows about angels or whatever it might be where they're doing good deeds and all, all roads lead to God and it doesn't really matter what you believe, everything will be okay in the end as long as you just do some good deeds, you know, help the little old lady across the street and, uh, you know, God will smile at that and in the end, you know, he'll, he'll take you on that elevator up to the sky. But uh, what we're going to do is look at Bible teachings and doctrines. These are things I have not made up. I'm just going to go to the, the Bible itself, read these things, and let our viewers see some of the things the Bible teaches. Things that uh, a lot of people may take offense at, may not like at all. And I believe that they're unpopular and, and are fairly well unknown uh, because a lot of preachers know that these things are unpopular, and they don't want to preach them in their church. They don't want to tell you about them, because then you might get mad at them, and then you might not send them money or a donation or support them of, of whatever. Of course, I don't do this show for money anyway, so <laughs> I don't, I'm totally unrestricted. I can tell people whatever I believe the Lord has said in the Bible, and I don't worry about the consequences. I just like to give the whole counsel of God much like Paul said in Acts chapter 20. So we're going to take a little look here during the time of this broadcast and, and look at unpopular Bible doctrines. And I'll just be reading scripture passages and you can follow along with me and uh, make a decision whether you like that or not. But whether you like it or not doesn't really matter. What matters is God said it and it's in the Bible. And now, if you just want to pick and choose what you like and don't like, well, there's no reason to have a Bible anyway. If you don't like more things in the Bible than you like, then why even bother with the Bible? I mean, if you're going to pick and choose what you want, there's no reason to bother with a Bible. Just make up your own religion. Just pull out some paper and a pen and start writing your own religion. Uh, at least then you'll be happy with it. But the key here is we're going to take a look at what the Bible says and uh, and it is, is just take it for what it is. What, and what it is is truth. It's the truth of God. And uh, sometimes truth is hard to take. In fact, you can get somebody more mad at you by telling them the truth than you know giving them uh, baseless platitudes and falsehoods to make them feel better uh, or whatever you want to say. Sometimes. Uh, you can get someone more mad at you by telling them the truth about themselves rather than a lie about them. <laughs> That's really what I meant to say. Uh, because the truth always hurts. And lies, though, they don't affect people so much because they go, well, that's a lie and it's not true and it doesn't really bother me. But, man, when something's the truth, and that is the kind of thing that can really hurt. So let's take a look at some of these things and see how how badly... Uh, some of my viewers might get hurt. <laughs> but anyway, the first one we're going to look at is God is jealous and He sets the rules. Not you, not me. He sets the rules. And this this first one may be familiar to you, uh, but maybe you've never really looked at it the way you should look at it. It's found in Exodus chapter 20. Verses 2 through 17, and basically what this is, is the Ten Commandments. But what I found about the Ten Commandments and people's knowledge of it is they're familiar with the Ten Commandments, but they couldn't say they couldn't name the Ten Commandments to save their lives, let alone some of the things that we find within the Ten Commandments. So let's take a quick look here 
and see if we can find some things that people won't like or would find to be very unpopular. But this is Moses writing Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, starting in uh, verse 3. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse 4, and of course, already that's going to be unpopular with a lot of different religious people and polytheists and Hindus and other people that, that like to have lots of gods. But anyway, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You can also cross-reference that to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1. Anyway, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I bet you never noticed that stuff about the Ten Commandments before. Verse 6, I'll come back and do a little commentary on this. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Verse 7, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor, nor manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the, he the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, uh, that thy days be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 13, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Okay, that was the Ten Commandments. I read them all. But what I wanted to notice, what, what I wanted you to notice about this, is a couple of things. First, verse three there, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and you can go to all kinds of other references, uh, from Jeremiah twenty-five six, Deuteronomy thirty-two sixteen through eighteen, uh, Deuteronomy chapter six verses four thirteen and fifteen, and a host of others about God not liking people worshiping other gods. So right away we have a problem here that people want to say that you can believe anything as long as you're sincere. All roads lead to God. You can just believe anything you want to believe in any God you want. Well, that's not true according to the Ten Commandments. God doesn't want you worshiping any other God. He wants you to worship Him who is the true God. So get that down. And then no graven images. There's a lot of people in this world that build statues, idols, uh, statues of the Virgin Mary, or whatever. And they, they pray to these things. Uh, saints or whatever, you're not supposed to do that either. And it's right here in verse 4. No graven images. You're not to bow down to any of these things, but we know in the world people are doing that. But the main thing and the main reason I'm bringing this out, this first one here in our little list of unpopular Bible doctrines, is the fact of verse 5. And this is what I think a lot of people have missed when it comes to the Ten Commandments. Verse 5, I'll read it once again. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Did you get that? Jealous God. And he's so jealous that he goes on to say here, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So this is something that not just goes to the immediate generation, it goes on for generations, and God's going to visit their iniquities upon them, on them that hate him. And yes, people hate God. Everybody thinks, oh, yeah, as long as you're sincere, and I, I love God and I believe in God. Yeah, but is it the God of the Bible? Is it this God, the one he's talking to us? Or is it some God you made up in your own mind? 
Do you, you may think you love God, but you really hate him. And God even says people hate him. And he says it right here. But as I, I, I'm just mentioning things that people never notice about the Ten Commandments. But the main thing is God is jealous. He is a jealous God. You can look at it also Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. You can go to Nahum. And in fact, I think I will go there next. Nahum chapter 1, verse 2. Let me pull out my Bible here for that reference. It's in the Old Testament. If I can find Nahum, he's uh, one of those fiery Old Testament prophets. And it says right here in chapter 1, verse 2, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. Those are the guys we were just reading about that hate him. Okay, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Now, almost all these guys that make graven images, have other gods, uh, bow down to other things, they all say they love God. But what God's saying is, no, they don't really love him. They hate him, and he's going to take vengeance on them. He's going to exert wrath on them. He's furious with them. If you read the rest of this chapter in Nahum, I don't have time to do it. He's going to destroy. He's going to do all kinds of terrible things, bring destruction on these people. And why? Why is he going to do something like that? It's because God is jealous. See, people hate that. They didn't. A lot of people don't realize God is jealous. They think God's like a big Santa Claus, and he'll just buy into anything you feel like uh, selling them. But no, God's jealous. He wants your worship. He wants you to worship him as he is. But see, people don't want that. They don't want to worship God the way he is and the way he presents himself as righteous and holy and true and just. They want a God that they make up in their own minds. They want a God like that. But it doesn't work out that way. It doesn't work out that way at all. Exodus chapter 34, verses 14 through 17. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Notice right there, it's mentioned not once, but twice. A name for God is Jealous, and he emphasized the fact that he is a jealous God. Verse 15, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. Notice the go a whoring. And then in verse 16, the same thing. Whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Verse 17, thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Notice the point here. God is jealous. It's emphasized twice. It's a name for God. And then he says, anyone that worships these other gods, molten gods, false gods, are basically prostituting themselves. They're whoring after false and imaginary gods that do not exist, exist except in the minds of these false worshipers. And God hates that. And that's the emphasis of this jealous God here in this passage. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, They provoked him, that's God, to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. So here's some sincere religious people worshiping gods, idols, whatever, in a sincere fashion. But uh, all their sincerity won't help because what God says here is he's provoked to jealousy because these are strange gods. These aren't the true and living God. These are something else. And what are they? Verse 17 says, They sacrifice unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So these sincere religionists who are worshiping their idols, uh, practicing their religion to their gods, uh, God himself, who is jealous about this, states clearly that they are not worshiping the true God. They are worshiping and sacrificing to devils. And this is one reason that false religion can lead the sincere followers of religions astray 
in a in a most profane way. Uh, Cross reference this, if you will, to First Corinthians chapter ten, verses twenty and twenty one. Now look at John chapter eight, starting in verse forty one. Jesus is confronting religious Jews, and these Jews tell Jesus, "We have one Father." even God. So they're proclaiming that their father is God Almighty. Verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Verse 43, Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil. And the less of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Now notice this text. Here are sincere religious Jews in Jesus' day, in verse 41, proclaiming that God is their father, and they are believers in him. Jesus begs to differ, and he says, no, God's not your father, because if God were your father, you would believe the truth, but you believe lies, and therefore your God is really the devil. Your father is the devil, not God. Even though these guys are sincere in their religion, Jesus plainly tells them, no, your God is the devil, not the true and living God, because he's a liar, and y'all You guys here, you believe in lies and falsehoods because your religion is false. And that's the whole point of this whole series on why God is jealous. God is jealous because people are believing lies, false gods, believing in devils, sacrificing the devils, and to the devil himself, rather than a true and living God. And that's why God's going to judge them. And this is why we can find a place like this where Jesus says, they are not believing the truth, but lies Your father is the devil. Psalm 96, verse 5 and following, says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Notice all the gods of the nations are idols. And we already know what God... The jealous God thinks of these idols, and we should fear before him because of his judgment and wrath. But unfortunately, most people have no fear of God, and they worship their idols. Let me uh, go to another passage that ties in with this doctrine before I move to the next most unpopular doctrine. Okay, uh, this is uh, Zephaniah I'm looking for here. Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 8, I have now found it. It says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, unto the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And you can go to all kinds of passages. There's plenty of passages throughout the scripture about God being jealous. And he gets mad when you are worshiping other gods. You are not worshiping him the way he should be. You make up fake and false gods and fake religions. He gets mad about it. And he's going to bring fury and indignation on your head because God is jealous And this is a doctrine that is very unpopular. Okay, that's point number one. With that, let's go to point number two. And I think a lot of people are really going to hate this one. I'm almost positive they're going to hate this one. Okay, why did God choose the Jews instead of somebody else? Did you ever think about that? You've always heard about the Jews being the chosen people. Those are the ones that God chose, and he led them out of Egypt, uh, you know, and, and, and the ten plagues on on uh, Pharaoh and 
all of that. Well, God certainly did choose him. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, you get all those stories there given to you in the scripture. But did you know Moses tells us why God chose the Jews and he didn't choose somebody else? Like, how come God didn't choose the Egyptians? Why did God kill the firstborn of all the house of Pharaoh and of Egypt and, and put all those curses and plagues on them why did he do that to them? Why didn't he choose the Egyptians instead? And he, but we, we find that he chose the Jews rather than the Amalekites, the Moabites, the Jebusites, and all the other ites. Well, he gives us the answer in Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verses 6 through 8. And I've had quite a few people get mad at me when I've read this. And what's funny is I didn't, I didn't even have to do an exposition on it. All I had to do was read it, and they got mad. Now we'll see what your reaction is when I read these passages. And you'll see it on your screen here. And you can kind of follow along with me. Okay, starting in verse 6. It says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. You can also cross-reference that to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 15. But anyway, he's telling you he's chosen you above any of the other people that are on the face of the earth. It's you, the Jews. You were chosen. Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. So the numbers here don't make any difference. It, numbers had nothing to do with this. In fact, he says, I chose you, and it just turns out you're the fewest of all these people that are on the earth. So there's all these people, there's lots of them, but God chooses this line of Jews coming from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 8, but why? Why does he do it? Okay, verse 8. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Well, there's your answer. Verse 8, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Why did God choose the Jews rather than all these other people who were more in number on the face of the earth? than these Jews. Why did he choose them? Verse 8, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep his oath, which he had sworn unto your fathers. There's your answer. Why did he choose the Jews? Because he loved them. Now, I know that goes against a lot of people's sensibilities. They like to think of John 3.16, For the God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And all that's true, of course. That is true. God loved the world, but who did he love in the world? And that's the whole point of the, the situation. Does God love everybody? Or does he just love some of these people down here? And when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 8, and you find that the reason he, he chose the, the Jews is because he loved them, then you have a serious question to ask yourself. Because we already know there's a lot of people that hate God. But would, uh, would God hate anybody in return? You know, people hate God, but does God hate them? That's an interesting question. And we always hear in our society, in our culture, oh, God loves everybody. God has to love everybody, and God is love. And there are scripture verses that show that, especially in 1 John. Uh, God is love. There's no doubt about it. God has a tremendous love. In fact, there's no greater love than this, that uh, a man should lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And the love of God that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, that is in that is divine love. But what the question we have to ask ourselves here is, does God have that kind of love for everybody? Does he love everybody like that? Or does he only love some people like that? Well, obviously, looking at Deuteronomy chapter 7, 
he chose the Jews because he loved them. What does that mean about the Egyptians? What does that mean about the Amalekites? What does that mean about the Jebusites or the Moabites or all the other ites? You have to ask yourself these questions. I'm simply just reading the text of, the, of what the scripture says. But now uh, let's let's move on to this third point here about does God love everybody? Well, we have uh, we have some scripture verses here. I think that would be of interest to you. I'm I'm not trying to answer this, uh, you know, with my opinion. I'm trying to answer this from the Word of God, and uh, I think a uh, a good reputable source for speaking on this subject is the Apostle Paul. He knows a lot more about the things of God than I do. Even though I've been trying to study it as much as I can over the last 20 years, I, I'll never come close to you know, the men of God such as Paul. So let me, let me go to the Apostle Paul excuse me, in his uh, epistle to the Romans in chapter 9, starting in verse 11. And let's see about whether God loves everybody or not. And when we think about those passages like John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world, does that word world mean every last man, woman, and child? Does that mean Mao Zedong? Does that mean Joseph Stalin? Does that mean uh, Adolf Hitler? Does that mean you know all the serial killers and the child murderers? And uh, does that mean everybody that ever lived, or does that world? Because that mean does that word world? Can it mean something else? Or are there multiple uses of the word world in the Bible? Well, let's take a look here at what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 11. He says, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. Verse 13. And it is written, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And of course, he's, he's taking that right out of Malachi, out of the Old Testament, chapter 1, starting in verse 2 and following. So right here we have a passage point blank from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, Romans chapter 9, verses 11 through uh, uh, 13. And it says that there's these twins that haven't even been born yet. They haven't done any good or evil yet. They haven't done any works. They're, 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 like I said, they're not even born yet. They're twins. And yet God loves one of them. That's Jacob. And he hates the other one. That's Esau. And it's not because of anything they did. It's, and he tells you why. Why? It says that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. Not of works, but of him, that's God, that calleth. Now, you know, you can try to say what you want, but I'm looking at a passage here, and it says that before they've done any good or evil, any works, they're not even born yet, God loves one of them, and he hates the other. Now, I know a lot of people try to get around that. Get around that. I've been in quite a few debates with different people that say, "Oh, it can't mean love." I mean, hate. It has to mean something. Else. But now, the, you know, the love means love to them. You know, but the hate. No, that can't mean can't mean hate. But uh, let's let's take a uh, another look at some of the other passages in, in Scripture that tie in with this idea of hate. And I'm going to go back to the Old Testament now to uh, King David. We're going to look at the Psalms. We're going to go to Psalm 11 and look at verse 5. What does David say here? Psalm 11, verse 5, it says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Let's talk about God here. Verse 6, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. And you often see throughout the scripture, uh, particularly like Psalm 75, 8, other, many other places about the cup of the wrath of God. 
and they shall drink of the cup of the wrath of God. And uh, their cup is not yet full. Wait till the fullness of time that their cup of wickedness is full, and then God will judge them. You get all this throughout the Scripture. And even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think it's in Mark chapter uh, uh, 14, shall I not drink this cup? And that's the cup of the wrath of God. He's going to take the wrath of God for us so that sinners, wicked sinners, might be saved. But now look at this. Look at it again. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. And what is he going to do to these guys that he hates that do these things? He's not talking about he's not talking about how he hates their sin. He's talking about how he hates them. <laughs> he's talking about how the wicked he hates because they love violence, and his soul hates them. And what is he going to do? Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. And it's funny when you read about the Bible, and that's another doctrine, I mean, about hell. That's another doctrine people hate. That's one of my points coming up later. I'll get into hell after a while. But when you look at the way Jesus, who talked more about hell than he ever did about heaven, talks about hell, and, and, and this fire and brimstone, and, and the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, and Jeremiah, and all these other guys, they're talking about hell, and, and you find this fire and brimstone coming down on people that are cast into hell, where the false prophet and the beast are, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. You find that these people are going to be tormented day and night, the fire and the brimstone and all these things. God does that to people he hates. But to people God loves, he doesn't do that. He chose them. He elected them. He loves them. He doesn't want them to go to be burned by fire and brimstone and tempests. You think a guy that God loves, if God really loves him, he's going to let them suffer like that? No way. He's going to save them through the, through the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will redeem, redeem them through being born again by a renewal of their spirit. Their spirit will be regenerated by the Holy Ghost. And they will... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thus they shall be saved and escape the wrath of God. That's because God loves. God has this great love and he loves them. He doesn't want them to die a death like that and go to a place like that, like hell. But what does it say in Psalm 11? It says he hates these guys and he's going to do all this terrible stuff to them. But now let's take it a step further. Let's go over here to Psalm 5. So here it says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Verse 6. Now these are the ones he hates. And just like any other passage, what happens to these guys? Verse 6. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Now look at this. It doesn't say he hates their sin. Now, God hates the sins of people. Don't, don't get me wrong. God hates their sins. But it also says he hates them. <laughs> it's not saying here it hate, he hates their sins. He hates them. And as it says, hateth all workers of iniquity, and the Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. He abhors that man. And why does he abhor that man, that man himself? Because he's bloody and he's deceitful. He's wicked. And he's going to get him, basically, to use a, a common term in, in the American vernacular, in the end with this righteous judgment and the wrath of God, that cup of wrath that, where these people are going to face the wine press of the wrath of God. And I don't know if you ever stop to think about it, but in Revelation, you get a concordance. And get a do a word study on the word blood, and look what the Apostle Paul said. I mean, uh, John says in the book of Revelation about blood, and you're going to see over and over and over again God's wrath is going to pound the wicked and the sinners till their blood comes out and flows out, and the the blood comes up to the horse bridles. And I mean, it's it's terrible stuff, and people hate this. The only reason I'm talking like this is because I'm doing a show on what people don't like, what's unpopular, and you're not going to hear much about. 
Well, I'm just going to, I just had to tell you these things because you're not going to hear. I, outside of this show, I don't know if you're going to hear much about any of the, thing, the things I'm talking about. But I figured this, this was an opportunity to let you know what's in the Word of God and see it for yourself. And it's been coming up on the screen, and you can read it and see it for yourself. And hell ties right into all of this. Here we have Isaiah chapter 63, verses 3 and following. Now this is a truly terrifying passage. It reads, and this is God speaking, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart. And the year of my redeemed is come, and I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. We all think of I Love Lucy when she's stomping on the grapes in that Italian uh, I Love Lucy show. This is what God says he's going to do. He's going to tr- stomp on the wicked like, like uh, a, a wine press guy stomps on grapes, and the blood's going to splatter all over God's clothes. Remember this from Revelation chapter 19 with Jesus. All right, so these references to hell are, I'm not going to read them all. I'll just give you some of the references. It's everlasting fire. Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 25. It's eternal punishment, Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. Outer darkness, Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. And, And most of this is coming from the lips of Jesus himself. Uh, it's you know it's a lake of fire Revelation 19 you've got uh, it uh, being a place uh, prepared for the devil and his angels the wicked the disobedient fallen angels beast and the false prophet uh, worshippers of the beast rejectors of the gospel that's Matthew chapter 10 verse 15 uh, it, it, it's a punishment is described as eternal bodily uh, with degrees of punishment Matthew 23 14 uh, and, and a host of other references I could give you, but for lack of time, and most people being familiar with this doctrine of hell anyway, uh, I'll, I'll just leave you with that. But see, the whole point of the matter is, if God loves a person, he has provided a way through his son Jesus Christ so that that person that he loves may not have to go to a place like this for all eternity. God's so loved the world, and that's those that have been chosen before the foundation of the earth. And in fact, uh, that brings me to uh, another point I guess I might as well mention, and that is uh, God has chosen certain people to be saved. And all this links together. I might as well just go there now. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, my Bible is totally falling apart on me. I don't know how many more years I'm going to be able to use this thing before it just totally collapses. But anyway, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. God said it himself. It's right there. It says in verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not your will, but God's will. And as you go on, you see in verse 9, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, this will and good pleasure being purposed in God in himself, verse uh, 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, Time is rapidly running on me in this show, and I've got a, a list of things. So I won't be able to go into as great a detail here as I started the program with, but I want you to understand that God has predestined people. He's elected to, uh, people to be saved according to his own will before the foundation of the earth. And uh, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And there's many other passages I could bring up here, but all this ties into the fact that God is jealous. God has a holy righteousness, justice, and mercy. He will not tolerate the wicked. He abhors the wicked. He hates them. But he has a love for some that he's put his mercy on through a predestination by his own will 
were those people before the foundation of the earth, and that would be Jacob as we, we think about Romans 9 as we went through, uh, God loved them. They were saved from this unpopular place called hell. And one reason all these doctrines I've mentioned so far that are so unpopular are so unpopular is because a lot of people know in their hearts they were never born again. They've never been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. But they, at the same time, want to think they're going to be okay with God in the end. And it's no matter how they live, they don't have to repent of their sins. They don't have to really turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, give their lives to Jesus Christ. They can live like they want to, but they think in their mind, well, I'll believe in him and I'll be okay. Well, see, none of that works. And they, they go that route. And they hate what I'm saying here because they know it hasn't happened to them personally. They, they hate these doctrines I'm mentioning because they know... They've never really experienced that love of God. They, they don't know what that love of God is where they've been born again and, and they can escape the wrath of God and, and they don't know that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And so it's easy for them to forget these doctrines I'm talking about and just think, oh, everything will be okay. And these doctrines really don't matter and this isn't really true. Well, it is true according to Scripture and you can't, you can't just ignore it like that. Because if this Bible's true, then you're going to have to deal with it. And like I said before, if it's false... And, and or else if you're just going to pick and choose what you want, well, we'll get rid of it anyway because it's, it's no good to you. It's worthless. You might as well just write your own Bible and try to live by that. But anyway, uh, with time flying, I'm going to go with some of these other doctors in more of a fast-paced way because otherwise I'll never get through them all. Okay, another doctrine that's very unpopular to people, and all this ties in, I don't know if you've noticed, but all this ties in with the sovereignty of God. God is in control. You're not in control of God. He doesn't have to do what you say. You're supposed to be doing what he says. And that's why and that's another reason people don't like these doctrines and most people hate God even when they say they think they love God. And uh, let's take a look here at some of these the, this next uh, unpopular doctrine. Did you know that God sends evil spirits to men? Now I'll put the I'll put the uh, screen graphic up, but I'm not going to have time with time remaining to to read all these verses. I'll just expound a little bit on them while you read the screen graphic at home while I'm talking here. But anyway, in First Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 through 16, also verse 23, and you can cross reference that with First Kings chapter 22, verses 20 through 23. You have there where God sent an evil spirit to King Saul. He was really just messed up by this evil spirit. In fact, uh, David had to play his harp just to make Saul feel better as he's being tormented by this evil, excuse me, this evil spirit being sent to him. And then, of course, in 1 Kings, that's a real, that's a real incredible one because that's uh, where God actually sends an evil spirit to Ahab so he'll be destroyed at a battle. He asks these spirits, who will go with me to persuade him? To make the mistake of going to this battle, and uh, you know one of the one of the uh, spirits spoke up, and God said, "Well, go, and you'll be a, a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets." And uh, that was a direct ordination by God, and God judged Ahab through these evil spirits speaking lies through his prophets. And of course, another uh, famous passage, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses nine through twelve where it says, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie because they believe not the truth, that, that God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe, believe a lie uh, because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And for this cause, God you know, sent them that delusion and uh, that they all might be damned who, had, who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you have here once again God directly determining uh, whether someone believes the truth or not. And it's directly related to whether they will believe the truth. And, and do they love, love unrighteousness? And this is a judgment of God. And people hate that. Okay. Uh, did you ever think, did you ever think of why Jesus spoke in parables? Did you ever give any thought why he spoke in parables? There's a reason why Jesus spoke in parables. And he even tells you the reason in the gospel. In fact, in uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and you can see it on your screen, Jesus tells you right there why he speaks in parables. It's so they won't understand him. So they won't understand what he's talking about. And they won't repent. 
lest at any time the Father should forgive them. <laughs> I mean, look, it's there on the screen. You can read it for yourself. I'm not making this up. That's why if Jesus wants everybody to be saved and God wants everybody to go to heaven, then why would Jesus speak in parables? And why would he say such a thing as this? Are you seeing something here? Are you seeing the kind of power God has? And why this would be so unpopular? But look, Jesus said it. It's there on your screen. That's a very unpopular doctrine. Okay, let's go to another one. Uh, uh, something that's very unpopular, uh, especially among our wicked and evil people that live among us, and we're all sinners. Uh, Romans 6.23 says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all sinners. Jesus said men love darkness rather than light because their, e e their deeds are evil. So we naturally, in our natural state, hate God, even, uh, and we hate good, good and righteous things. Uh, it even says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul said that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. We, in our natural state, we hate God. And that's uh, basically what the Greek says. And so what doctrine would men hate a lot based on the fact that we're all evil and wicked and we don't like God that much anyway because we often think God's kind of a big bully because he comes out with these Ten Commandments. He wants us to live by that. We're supposed to do what God says. We're supposed to do good deeds and... And we're not supposed to commit adultery, and we're not supposed to steal and murder and all these things, uh, covet our, our neighbor's possessions. Who does God think he is? God? Well, that's why we get upset with God, because we don't like God telling us what to do, because we want to be God of our own selves. Well, anyway, uh, another doctrine that's very unpopular with people is the doctrine of God's holiness. God's holiness. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, uh, the angels cry in heaven. Particularly, you get passages like Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. You have Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. The holiness of God is throughout the scripture. And God has a holy righteousness. God has a holy love, a holy justice. That holiness of God uh, basically... Uh, overflows over all his other attributes. So we talk about the love of God, that's a holy love. If we talk about the justice of God, that's a holy justice. If we talk about a wrath of God, that's a holy wrath. Because God is holy and men hate that. They A lot of times they don't even think about it. They, 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 they know about the holiness of God, but they don't really apply it to its logical conclusion. If we are wicked sinners and we're living in a life that's unpleasing to a holy God, well, what's what's going to be our final state? What's going to become of us by a holy God? Can a holy God just let us off the hook just like that? We can be as wicked and evil as we want, and a holy God's going to let us off the hook no matter what we do or how we act or what we believe? See, you've got to take this to a logical conclusion. If we really look at the holiness of God, that necessarily means then that we need to live in a holy manner ourselves. And we don't want to do it. And that's why we hate the holiness of God. Because that convicts us of our evil and wicked deeds. If God is holy, that just exposes our wicked and evil deeds all the more. And that's why men don't like this doctrine. Well, anyway, I could go on on that, but time's flying. Okay, the next one. And I mentioned this already, and I won't spend much time on it, but the fact that God is sovereign, that God's in control. Men don't like that. They want to be in control themselves. But check out passages like the one you see on your screen. Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 through 36. Uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 37. It just basically says that no matter what happens, God's in control. And uh, whether a bird comes from the east or flies to the west or whatever, God's in control of what goes on. And uh, no man can raise his fist to God and say, what doest thou? Because we're just men and God is running the show. Even, at the, even at, as Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross on the night of his betrayal and the last supper, he was in control of everything. 
because Jesus being God himself, of course, uh, God in the flesh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. What does Jesus do? He's in control of his whole situation. He decides he's not going to get out of getting crucified. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to die. He's at the Last Supper. He tells Judas, who he knows is going to betray him. He doesn't tell Judas, don't betray me, Judas, don't do it. No, he says, Judas, what you do, do quickly. And Judas gets right up. Satan enters into him. And he goes out to lead the rabble back to Jesus and take him away with swords and staves. Jesus was in control of everything. He was talking before Pontius Pilate. He's, he's there with Pilate, and Pilate asks him what is truth. And, and Jesus said, uh, you know, he could, he could bring 12 legions of angels and things like that if he wanted to. But uh, Jesus was in control of everything all the way to his last breath on the cross. Okay, that just shows you. The sovereignty of God, and men don't like that. They want to be sovereigns themselves. They want to be in control of themselves. Well, I'm, I'm down to less than five minutes in this program, but uh, a few other things I'd like to mention uh, uh, that are unpopular, that people don't seem to want to look at or realize, that did you know that Jesus was rude and judgmental? Read Matthew chapter 23. Look what he said to the scribes and Pharisees for the whole chapter. The whole chapter. He's blasting the scribes and the Pharisees. And if that's not enough, read John chapter 8. The, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees say, hey, we're of God. We're of our father Abraham. And Jesus said, if you were of your father uh, God, you would believe me. But you're not of, you're not of God. You're of the devil. You're, the, the father is your devil. And Jesus is telling these most religious guys, the church guys, these things. Now, people don't like that. They don't like a, they want a meek and mild Jesus. They don't want a Jesus that will make whips and go into the temple and run the money changers out of there and violently turn over their tables and knock their money all over the ground and, and said, you've made this a den of thieves and it's a house of prayer. Jesus was rude and judgmental. And this is a biblical fact. And people don't want to see that. They want to look at this meek and mild Jesus who's, you know, got the, 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 uh, the, the uh, hairdresser uh, 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 demeanor, and uh, he's not going to hurt a fly, you know. And we get the same thing in the same sense where Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39, that Jesus came not to bring peace, but a sword. And he said he he came and he's going to cause dissension even among your own household. A mother will be against daughter, daughter against mother, father-in-law against sons-in-law, and so forth. People, your enemies will be those of your own household. Jesus said he came to bring a sword, not peace. And this is another thing that, that strikes against people. Another thing that's un, unpopular, and I, I'm going to run out of time before I get through all the unpopular things that could be, but I think you've got a good idea already of what we're talking about here. But uh, another thing that's unpopular is Christians are to rebuke and correct people when they're wrong about either theology or morality and things of this nature. We are commanded, like in Titus 1.9, it says, exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict we have verses all over the place. In fact, uh, to conclude, I think I ought to just finish up with Titus here. Let me just go to Titus. And there's many other places like Revelation chapter 2. You ought to see what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verses 2, 9, 13 through 15. Uh, but here in, in, in Titus, and there's many other places, particularly in uh, uh, Timothy, uh, passages like this. But uh, in Titus... Chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, doctrine to both exhort and convince the gainsayers. And then in verse 15, it says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Verse 16, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. And he's talking about people who say they know God. 
That's exactly what he's saying. And people will say, oh, you're being judgmental and judgmental unless you also be judged and all this stuff. Of course, they don't read the rest of Matthew 7 there when, in, in, where Jesus says you are to judge. But anyway, the key is uh, these unpopular doctrines. People say they know God, but they don't know him, and they're reprobates, the scripture says. That's a very unpopular doctrine. Jesus is the only way. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is God Almighty. In the Gospel of John chapter 20 verse 28, Thomas said, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Thomas said this directly to Jesus Christ, ascribing to him the titles of Lord and God. Also, Romans chapter 9, verse 5, it says, Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. Christ is over all, God, blessed forever. There is only one true religion. And that is Christianity. Now, of course, this is very unpopular among many people in the world. But in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Otherwise, in the Greek, anathema, be damned. Paul is saying, if you don't believe this gospel the way it is presented to you in the scripture as we presented it to you, then you are teaching a gospel that will not save and will result in damnation under the wrath of God. God's word, the Bible, not the Upanishads or the Vedas or all these other religious books in the world, but the Bible is truth for mankind. And to prove that and the gravity of it, God says in Psalm 138, Verse 2b, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God magnifies his written word, the word he has given to man, above even the names that he possesses. This is incredibly uh, important. Also in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, we find that according to the same word that God has magnified, it says, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So this is the key, this is the truth that God wants us to know, that we can be saved by this Lord Jesus Christ, which is presented to us in God's word, which he has magnified above all his name. Well, I'm out of time. Uh, thank you for joining me. I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers. Uh, if you'd like to uh, contact us for free literature, more information on this subject and other subjects, uh, Call a number at the end of the show or, or email us or contact our website there. Get, well, we do have newsletters and other literature available for the asking. Thank you for being with me. Uh, I hope you're not too mad at me about all this. But uh, just remember, I'm just a Western Union Telegraph boy who's bringing you a message. You don't shoot him when he gives you bad news. I'm just bringing you what God already said in the Bible. Anyway, God bless you all. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.